turn in our Bible, if you will, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, again. Ephesians, chapter 1. Last week, we talked about the fact that uh, if you're a believer, you have an adoption certificate in the Bible. And we looked at Ephesians 1 as uh, part of the passage that we studied that subject of adoption in. Remember the fifth verse of chapter 1, where it talks about God having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the pleasure of his goodwill. See the word predestinated in that fifth verse of Ephesians 1? That is one of the most misunderstood Bible subjects ever. It's a, a word that has caused great controversy. Predestination. I think it has been majorly misused. For instance, some teach that that word means that God foreordained the destiny of all people. That he predestinated some people to heaven and that he predestinated some people to hell. Well, I want to say right from the beginning, that is false. That is false. The Bible said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says that it is God's will that all men come to a knowledge of the truth and thus are saved. It is not God's will to predestinate people to hell. And so if you really want to understand the Bible word predestination or predestinated, you simply have to be willing to abandon all your bias and make the Bible your only guide and let the Bible say what it means and mean what it says. Because I'm telling you, you can't come up with this idea that God foreordained and predestinated some to heaven and some to hell from the Bible. You get that from someone's messages, someone's teachings, someone's books, someone on the internet. You get it from men. You don't get that from God's Word. And so if you can just for a, a few minutes put aside your prejudices, your biases, and just listen to what the Bible says, I think you'll get a proper understanding of what it means when God says that we have been predestinated. Okay? Let's take a moment. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask Him to certainly guide us. So, Heavenly Father, we look to You. We thank You for the Bible. It is the Word of God, and we want to take it at face value, and we want to believe it. We want to believe what it says. Would you direct our thoughts? Would you work? And Lord, would you enable us to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ and uh, under the auspices of your word, the spirit-inspired word of God? We thank you for this passage and the other one that we'll look at this, this afternoon. Use it mightily. Open our eyes that we might see. We pray that you would remove the bias that perhaps has blinded us to the simple truth of this matter of, of being predestined. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at a definition here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. In fact, the word predestined uh, predestination we call it it appears six times in the entire New Testament two of the times it uh, it either refers to Jesus or to the gospel here four times it refers to believers two times here and a couple of times in Romans 8 where where we will uh, go to after Ephesians 1 and so I wanted you to know that 
again, the book of Ephesians is addressed to believers. In fact, they are called saints in verse 1 of chapter 1. So that's who this matter of being predestined by God is addressed to. It is not that being predestinated makes you a child of God. Being predestined refers to people that already are the sons or the children of God. In fact, you are predestined in this passage and in the one that we'll look at in Romans 8, you are predestined to become something that hasn't happened yet. Notice it in that fifth verse. He says, Having predestinated us unto the, edo the adoption of sons. Now, right off, notice the connection with what we talked about last week. We talked about adoption. Uh, the adoption of sons. The adoption of children. And uh, remember the definition of that? Remember how we defined adoption? It is a distinct act of God in which he establishes our fi the final purpose that he has for believers. It's a distinct act of God in which he establishes the final purpose, the end goal of the believing life. Okay, That's how we defined it. Here... Notice, we are predestinated unto a dot. Predestination is tied to, is connected to being adopted. Now remember what adoption really was? It wasn't being made a son of God. That's the new birth. That's what it means when you're born again. You become a child of God. You become a son of God. Being adopted, we looked at it in Romans chapter 8 also. It is not being made a son of God, it's being placed as a son in the future, and you remember it is the redemption of the body. Remember that? And so, predestination in Ephesians 1 and verse 5 is connected to adoption. That distinct act of God in which he establishes the final purpose for the believer, and that is that we will have a body that is redeemed. And predestination, according to Ephesians 1.5, look at it, is also an act of God, something he sovereignly does. It's an act of God by which he makes that final purpose for the believer, adoption, absolutely certain absolutely certain we are predestinated unto the adoption of sons that's what predestination is it absolutely guarantees and certifies that our bodies will one day be redeemed as believers the predestined people here are not unbelievers they are believers and it refers to their final, the God's final purpose for them, and that is the redemption of the body or the adoption. Now, let's think about the word itself, what it connotes, its meaning. The meaning of predestination, it's actually a compound word in the original language. It is proorzo, and it means it's made up of the word pro, which means before, and the word orizo which means to mark out a boundary. In fact, we get our word horizon from the word orizo, from that Greek word. And so to mark out before the boundary or to mark out before the horizon when you're on a boat and you're looking out as far as you can ahead of you, you're looking at the horizon. You're looking at the farthest distance. Predestined to mark out ahead of time the farthest distance, which is, of course, God's final purpose for the believer, which is adoption, or the redemption of the body, as it's referred to in Romans chapter 8, and I think it's verse 23. The English word predestined that is uh, here before us is also a compound word. It is the word pre, which means before, 
And the word destin or destiny, which is, again, the farthest extent or the farthest end. And so believers are predestined to be sun-placed. Believers are predestined to be adopted. We have not yet uh, experienced the adoption of sons. That's an aspect of our salvation yet to come. That's when our body is redeemed. And that will take place, as uh, you may remember, at the rapture. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that uh, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, we shall all be changed. And this vile body will put on incorruption. That's adoption. That's the fulfillment of this adoption. And that is what we are told here in Ephesians 1.5. Believers are predestined to, to be adopted. The word means son placed. Placed in the son. Jesus. And so this is the meaning of it. Now look at the intention of it. Because it's talking about the, con uh, the consummation. Uh, before we turn to Romans, go down to verse 11 of Ephesians 1. Because here's the second uh, use of the word in uh, this chapter. He says, in whom, that's Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Here, what he is saying is the consummation of our salvation. The context here is that the believer's final destiny is already established along with our inheritance. That is, God's future plan. God has predestinated for the believer their future redemption of the body. It's all wrapped up along with the inheritance. Now, Let's jump over uh, for the rest of our time here this afternoon to Romans chapter 8. Having talked about the definition of being predestined or predestination, let's look at the, the, the intention of it uh, more closely. In Romans chapter 8, we have that very famous verse that we as believers often quote uh, when we face different circumstances. And that's verse 28. And we know, that is believers, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Okay, we're talking about believers, people that love God. People that are the people of God, they love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. To what? To be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, Messiah Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, here's the, here's the, the fourth time that the word predestined, uh, or predestinate or predestined occurs in the uh, New Testament as applying to believers. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, verse 30, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, jump back to verse 28 just for a moment as we begin. Note the fact that everything in the believing life, them that love God, everything in the believer's life works together for a purpose. It works together for a purpose. Well, what is that purpose? We are the, partip the, the participants in God's purpose. And he gives us that in verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Notice this. Who are the participants? Those whom he foreknew. Those who he knew would accept Jesus and become a child of God. Those are believers. Those are the ones that love God, according to verse 28, the call. Right? So the participants 
in God's purpose, in God predestinating, are believers, not unbelievers, they're believers. And then note the parallel between the second half of verse 29 of Romans 8 and the passage there in Romans, uh, or rather in Ephesians 1 5 that we already looked at. Whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Remember Ephesians 1 5, we are believers predestinated unto the adoption of sons. Here, predestinated believers to what? Be conformed to the image of his Son. Both of these things are talking about the same thing. Ephesians 1.5, Romans 8.29, this uh, part of being conformed to his image, speaking about the same thing happening at the same time, something yet future that hasn't happened to us. It is when God's children receive a glorified body and the, they become like Jesus. When you receive a redeemed, glorified body, guess what? That will impact your soul as well. And you will receive a glorified body that will include a glorified soul also. And you will be completely and totally, as a believer, conformed to the image of Jesus, of his dear son, of the son that, uh, we're, that's talked about there in that verse. And so... It's a glorified body. We're predestinated to have a glorified body that, of course, will include a glorified soul. We conform to the image of the Son. And then, verse 30. Really, it's a package deal, if you could think of it like that. The believer is predestinated, basically, to be glorified. That's what verse 30 is telling us. And there are other things connected with uh, being glorified because they're part of that package, you might say. It says, whom he did predestinate, he predestinated them to be glorified. That's the end goal. That's the final purpose for the believer. That includes the adoption. That includes the sun placing, the redemption of the body, which would, of course, include the glorified soul as well. And so, clearly, it's God's calling... God's justifying uh, will be a part of the believer's glorifying. The believer being glorified. This verse does not teach, verse 30 does not teach that, uh, that predestination happens to lost people in order for them to be saved. That's not what this is teaching. You have to impose that bias on this verse to make it say that. This verse does not say that, uh, that uh, God predestinates lost people to be saved. It's rather saying that God predestinates saved people to be glorified. That's simply what it's saying in this 30th verse. That, uh, that God glorifies those whom he saves. And so it's wrong to equate predestination with God calling people to salvation. God calls everyone, but some people respond wrongly. Some people don't respond at all. Some people resist the call of God. God called all of Israel, but not all of Israel believed. Not all of Israel received the Messiah. In fact, the majority didn't. And he blamed them for that. He said, I've called you, but you would not come to me that you might have life. And so predestination is not the calling of lost people to salvation. Get that out of your head. Someone taught you that. The Bible didn't teach you that. The Bible teaches that predestination is God calling saved people to be glorified that saved people will end up being glorified, that they will have a glorified body and soul one day. That's the biblical definition and uh, intention of this word predestination. It's really the ultimate destiny of every believer. 
a glorified body. Being glorified one. You can't enter heaven unless you're glorified. There's no place for you in the new Jerusalem until you're glorified. Because flesh and blood cannot uh, inherit the kingdom of God. It defiles. It corrupts. And so you have to undergo this glorification that verse 30 talks about in order to enter into that new Jerusalem. Romans 8, I think, is one of the greatest passages in the Bible that teaches eternal security of the believer. And uh, predestination, I think, is one of the strongest arguments for the believer's eternal security. Because it's teaching that once you become a child of God, that will never change. And you are, if you are a child of God, you are guaranteed that you will be glorified one day. And as a result, you'll enter into heaven, the new Jerusalem. Harry Ironside was a great uh, Bible teacher of days gone by. And he stated that salvation was like Noah inviting a pagan in his day to take his place in the ark and, and trust in God's word, come into the ark and be safe. But you know, some people, he said, view salvation like Noah offering to put a peg on the outside of the ark and telling them, you know, if you hang on tight enough through the storm, you'll be saved. Salvation isn't dependent upon believers holding on to God, but us being securely held by and in Christ. And believers are predestined to be glorified both body and soul, it will absolutely happen. There's no question about it. Do you have questions? Yeah. Does God uh, already know who will uh, respond beforehand to his calling? Does he know? Of course. Oh, he knows. Yes, of course. God's know. all knowing. Mm -hmm. But the, the word for no here in uh, this uh, 29th verse does not refer to lost people. Keep that in mind. It does not refer to lost people. It refers to believers. God for knows believers, and he knows, of course, who will believe in him, and he predestinates believers to this glorification, the redemption of the body. Yeah. Right. 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 And of course, again, the definition of biblical predestination has nothing to do with lost people. Yes. First time it makes a lot of sense. It's like Columbus wanted to go to this place. He was, was not predestined. He ended up here. And that's how it is. When you the rise and you go, you hope to get there, but there's no guarantee you're going to get there. As before, it's a guarantee. Absolute guarantee. Absolute guarantee. You're going to reach that farthest extent of salvation, that farthest destination, which is the adoption. Yeah. What about people who get saved, but then turn away from God, and like completely renounce Christ? What about them? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether people are saved or not. I can only go by what they tell me, but I don't know, and it's not for me to figure out, nor you, nor anyone, right? I don't know. I, I don't know. If they're saved, they will be glorified, even if they do turn away for a period of time. They will be glorified, okay? But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, and but that's not to say that we're that we're unconcerned with people that aren't living for the Lord. We are. We pray for them, but ultimately we don't know. Pastor Dan, you have anything to add to that? Uh, in okay. Anyone else? Yeah. So is it, uh, isn't that uh, the excuse people use? Uh, unbelievers an excuse. They could say, "Well, I, I haven't been predestinated, so I might as well just." Could be. That's exactly what Mary just said. Um, yeah, could be used as an excuse. It isn't. Live, it isn't. Live, uh, but people use that as an excuse sometimes. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a lot of arguments we could use, but uh, the predestination argument doesn't even apply to lost people. So it's a end of argument as far as I'm concerned. Any other questions? See, these Bible truths, if we will just put aside the bias that has been built up in our thinking by listening to preachers and teachers and reading books and theology, that uh, and just looking at the scripture and letting the scripture speak letting it say what it says and mean what it means the light goes on we human beings complicate things we muddle things we mix it up we make it much more difficult i think at times than what god intended it to be yeah Yeah, there's a difference between following, following steps of human logic versus letting the Bible speak. Big difference. Okay. Yeah, Brother Pedro. I'm not against theology. I just want it to be biblical. Okay? Yeah, Brother Dave. I don't follow you. I don't, I'm not, someone help me out here? Yeah. Well, I heard somebody say that if I believed in this predestination where uh, if they did something wrong, that it wouldn't affect them, but yet you also believe they can't sin. Oh, are you talking, are you, you're talking about eternal security? That, I'm talking to you, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, David, yeah. yeah. Are you talking about eternal security? Yeah. That uh, because I am secure, I live for God, or it doesn't matter? No, uh, yeah. Okay. You talking about, uh, yeah, sinless perfection? Okay. You're talking about uh, abuse of grace? Christ, 
That doesn't sound like a Christian viewpoint to me. That doesn't sound like a Christian at all, you know. A, uh, a believer rejoices over being predestined to glorification, and uh, they desire by the grace of God to live up to it. I don't know if that answers your question. Did I understand it correctly? Well, again, if you follow the logical steps, if you misunderstand predestination to be a predestination, whether, uh, you know, to salvation or not, then of course you can't know, you know, because it then depends upon you living it out to uh, match your calling or whatever. It becomes confusing, but I don't want to even go there because that's not what predestination means. It has nothing to do with uh, being called to salvation or not. That's where the waters get muddied. So, let me review. We are predestined to what? Maybe back up. Who is predestined? Believers. believers. And believers are predestined to what? The adoption. To the adoption of sons, which is the redemption of the body, a glorified body, which of course means that if you have a glorified body, obviously the soul that lives in the body must be glorified too, will be conformed to the image of his son, right? So the two things match, the two passages match. Predestined only applies to people that are already believers, and it is the glorification of the believer which is the final stage or the end purpose or result of our salvation again I remind you that salvation for our understanding is like in 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 three tenses in the past I was saved when I was born again I was saved and my spirit was regenerated in the present I am in the process of being saved in that God is is saving my soul he is doing a work in me, conforming me day by day into the image. In the future, when Jesus comes for his church, I will be saved, which involves the glorification of my body, which of course will have my soul in it, so my soul will be totally glorified at that point too. Does that make sense? We are predestined to that future tense as believers.